Hey, Keto. So today we are going to talk about uh, diplomacy of the 1930s um, and the entry of the United States into World War II. So in the previous chapter, we were learning about how Franklin Delano Roosevelt was responding to a domestic issue within the United States of the Great Depression during the 1930s. So we're going to start out this lecture talking about what's going on in the world at the same time as the Great Depression. So this is a really good example, um, as you guys are working on essays, <clears throat> of contextualization. So yes, we're going to learn about World War II starting today. Um, but keep in mind that like, if you were to write an introductory paragraph about World War II, um, or especially like how foreign policy shifts during like the 1930s, um, the context, the greater context for World War II um, in Europe, right, is the fact that the United States is dealing with this Great Depression or vice versa, right? So what's going on somewhere else in the world during the same time period that provides a greater context for the time period that you are studying. Um, and as we are diving like deeper now into the mid 20th century, <clears throat> the complexity of um, lots of different things going on in the country at the same time um, or in the world that influences the United States because we are now this global power. <clears throat> And therefore, you're going to see that we're really interconnected with other countries. So the first thing that I want you to focus on during this lecture in the, the first kind of chunk, it's almost like in three different chunks today, and it is going to be a long lecture, I can tell you that right now, is um, first you have the period of time in the 1930s where the United States is neutral, right? So think about how and why U.S. foreign policy changed from neutrality, like in the 1930s, 1935, to total involvement, and kind of how did that progress? It didn't go from the neutrality acts all the way to like just automatically entering the war in 1941 at Pearl Harbor. There was a transition because of how successful the Nazis were being, right? So look at that transition. It's almost like a gradual process. The next third of the lecture is looking at how the war affected the American economy and especially try to pay attention to the same type of practices that they used during the New Deal for this domestic issue, right, this Great Depression with Keynesian economics. And then how did they apply that same economic theory to a war in order to help stimulate the economy? And what were the differences between those two things, or those two, two um, examples? And then the last part of the lecture is going to be about the actual war, um, the progression of theaters and the, the two different focuses and then the end of the war um, and kind of the effects. Because, again, the United States will emerge as a superpower after World War II, and it's going to play a major role um, in the United States foreign policy through today. OK, so let's get started. First, let's talk about in uh, Asia, because really the, the conflict and aggression of the 1930s, it's going to be it's going to take place in two different um, two different continents. So first, it's going to start in Asia with the Japanese. Um, the Japanese were because they were kind of slow to um, industrialize. They've now they're kind of late to the game with this imperialism thing. So where the United States and European powers were kind of busy, um, probably 20, 30 years earlier, um, Japan is a little bit late to the game and they're industrializing. They are realizing that they need more natural resources. And so now they're looking for other places and they're taking it by force. So um, Korea, uh, Manchuria, which is a region of China, eventually they are going to um, invade multiple parts of China. And then their goal of taking a lot of those islands in the South Pacific, so Southeast Asia. Um, it starts as early as 1931. They ignore the League of Nations is kind of the first example of like a failure of the League of Nations, major failure of the League of Nations. They kind of ignore it. The United States, we, we um, issue the Stimson Doctrine, um, where we say like, hey, this violates the, our open door policy, which was um, established by John Hay. But again, they don't really pay any attention to us. And we don't really do anything. So this is an example of aggression, unchecked aggression. Um, and how that's going to grow into a bigger problem over the next decade. 
FDR's foreign policy within the 1930s, again, as the Great Depression is occurring, as they're passing New Deal legislation, he is also trying to um, kind of fix some of the wrongs that had been done by former administrations in regards to Latin American countries and diplomacy. So if you remember, like his his distant cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, with big stick diplomacy, right, that's going to create a lot of trouble with like Colombia, Nicaragua. Um, where they kind of resented the United States. And he's going to try and fix that. He also does away with dollar diplomacy, which was um, implemented by President Taft. Um, And again, really just trying to improve relations with um, Central America and South America. The Pan American Conference um, was, again, trying to a way to uh, repudiate what his cousin Teddy had done. Um, He does persuade Congress to nullify the Platt Amendment in Cuba. Although we wanted to keep Guantanamo Bay, which again, we still have today. So FDR did have some foreign policy that he worked on and directly related to the United States and the battling the Great Depression. So this was primarily foreign policy that was um, uh, economically focused. So he's going to recognize the Soviet Union in 1933, which previous Republicans had refused to do so just because of the communism and kind of the Red Scare. He did it more so based on just the fact that the Soviet Union presents a large market to be able to sell American goods to. So trying to stimulate American factory production, you need to have a demand for those goods. And so if you kind of like the same idea with imperialism and why we sought after relations with China, it was really designed in order to sell our goods to those countries. So he does recognize the Soviet Union in order to kind of create a relationship there to where we can sell our goods Um, and and helping to stimulate the economy a little bit. In addition to that, the Philippines was extremely expensive. Um, Ended up not being a wise investment back during the Spanish-American War. Um, And so the Tidings McGuffey Act is going to gradually remove American troops, because that's what's expensive is the American troops and the diplomats that are there um, helping them kind of create a government and kind of us over see them a little bit. So we start to gradually remove troops. Ironically, obviously, the Japanese are going to invade the Philippines. We're gonna have to evacuate all that anyways, they will gain their independence in 1946, as outlined. um, And this was the general trend, right? Because the Jones Act, which we talked about in 1916, um, that was done under Woodrow Wilson, kind of moral diplomacy, FDR is going to try to like tidy it up, but more with connected with the fact that it's just expensive during the Great Depression, trying to kind of cut the budget a little bit and focus those funds more on those domestic programs. Um, And then trade is going to, a a general focus on trade. So where the Republicans, um, Hoover, um, towards the end of the 1920s are going to up um, tariffs in order to kind of uh, protect American industry. It ended up decreasing global trade, which contributed to the global depression. So they are going to lower tariffs significantly in order to get other countries to lower their tariffs on us. So to really promote um, a global trade network and globalization. So in Europe, we talked about aggression of the Japanese in Asia. Now let's start looking at what's going on in Europe. Um, The Depression obviously plays a large role in that, but also the Treaty of Versailles. Um, There's a lot of nationalist resentment after World War I. um, And those depressions are going to give rise to these military dictatorships um, in Italy, obviously in Germany, and um, Uh, in Japan. Uh, In 1940, Germany, Italy, and Japan are going to sign an alliance and form the Axis powers. Um, That is going to be one of those indicators that we talk about in FDR's uh, uh, arsenal of democracy speech, where he kind of refers to that as this really big threat. Because by 1940, September of 1940, um, Europe is completely dominated by uh, really Germany and Italy. So starting in Italy, 1922, uh, Mussolini and his fascist regime regime rise to power. Fascism is uh, based solely, like with you, the most important part of their platform and their agenda or ideology is going to be nationalism, an extreme sense of nationalism to glorify the nation and their race. They do this, they implement this ideology with 
um, force with a military dictatorship. Um, it's conservative. It's on the far right end of the spectrum in that they do not believe in like communism. So uh, communists are one of the people that they targeted with their military dictatorship. Um, they do not believe in like confiscating property or like government owned property. They believe in like capitalism and things like that. Um, but there's also no like political opposition in a fascist government. It's going to attract a lot of war veterans. Um, in addition to that, their followers are called the black shirts. In Germany, it's pretty similar. You have the Nazi party. It's going to start in the 1920s as a reaction to the harsh conditions of the Treaty of Versailles. So remember the um, billions of dollars in war reparations that they cannot pay back. Um, it creates hyperinflation in Germany, and it really does create this enemy for the German people. Um, remember that like World War One, and when you look at wars, most of the time the people making the decisions are like, you know, the, the leaders um, and, you know, certain top tier of the government and of the economy, like socioeconomics, uh, the people in power. Um, this depression in the 20s or hyperinflation in the 20s affected every facet of German society to where they were like, well, why is this happening to us? Instead of finding blame in the former German leaders, they're now um, the leaders of this time period are are placing that blame on like the four, like the allied powers of World War I. Um, Adolf Hitler is going to use fear. He is going to use the power of his words and his speeches. He's very charismatic, a um, ton of energy. Um, what he said really played on the emotions of uh, using that rhetoric. It played to the emotions of um, the German people to where it made sense to them and they supported him and he became extremely um, popular. Uh, he also had a fascist um, style of uh, or view of government. So they're going to be, it's going to be a dictatorship. Uh, they're going to use the military to enforce. There's not going to be any opposition. If you oppose them, you're going to end up um, in one of the ghettos or uh, prison or something you know, worse than that. Their followers are called the brown shirts, and he is going to have complete control over the legislature by 1933. Basically, the legislature would pass laws that would give him as chancellor um, authority to carry out certain acts. In Japan, very similar. You have uh, nationalism, you have militarism that's going to rise in the 1920s and 30s. As the economy worsened, they're going to persuade that emperor, like I said a little bit earlier, that they're going to need more raw materials to fuel their industry. And so they are trying to create this great East Asia co-prosperity Fear. This is what they called it. Really what it is, is they're becoming like this imperial nation. They are taking their conquering land that was once sovereign in order to benefit themselves. Um, and they're really going to be able to kind of go unchecked for the majority of the, the 1930s. Meanwhile, in the United States, we are isolationists. We were upset about World War I. Um, there were views that our entry into World War One really wasn't just like looking back on it. Remember, that was something that we talked about back then. Um, it was something that we allowed to happen because we were trading with countries that were involved in the war. Um, we were traveling to those parts of the world that were at war, and that opened us ourselves up for the ability to kind of be drawn into it. They were Americans were not buying into the make the world safer democracy, like Wilson's kind of moral diplomacy. Um, in addition to that. So while Wilson was trying to focus or his justification for entry to war was like making the safe world for democracy and the, the idea of his 14 points in a league of nations, like that was his view of it, um, of why we should go to war. Congress's view among Republicans in particular was that it would kind of be good for a business. Um, not all Republicans, a lot of Republicans were isolationists, but there were some that were thinking, well, hey, as an industrialist, um, as someone that supports business, war is good for business. And so it was good for the banking industry. It was good for the munitions industry. Um, and so there were, so that was kind of like one of the causes too, why some people were, vote, did vote for the war. And Americans wanted none of that. Um, 
in the depression, their number one goal was to focus on the American economy and jobs. They liked the New Deal programs. That's where they wanted the money to go. They did not want to, in addition to losing their livelihood and like their jobs and things like that, they didn't want to lose their sons to a war that had nothing to do with us. So even though FDR was a little hesitant, he did end up signing these pieces of legislation, but isolationists are going to hold the majority of both houses. It was not a partisan issue. It was bipartisan. Republicans and Democrats agreed with this. Um, and they passed a series of neutrality acts that really only had to do with if war breaks out in Europe, because war hadn't even occurred yet. And that's really important, that if war breaks out in Europe, the United States is not going to sell any weapons to belligerent nations. So a, a, that means a nation that's at war, um, not like necessarily like the, the side that they think is responsible for it. Um, any nation at war. So we're not going to sell weapons. We're not going to allow citizens to travel on ships to those nations. Um, we're not going to give loans or credit to those nations. Um, and then we're also, uh, the last one had to do with the civil war that was occurring in Spain at the time. Okay. In addition to that, so a little bit later by 1940, as Hitler is pretty much dominating. Yeah. By that point, yeah, by that point he had invaded, um, France or occupied France all the way up to the English channel. Um, FDR was kind of like starting to lean towards like, well, we might need to start helping Great Britain because they're the only ones left to like check Hitler's um, aggression. Um, you have the America First Committee that's going to be created that you guys we already kind of talked about a little bit. Um, the committee was formed to really mobilize public opinion and use uh, celebrities like Charles Lindbergh. Uh, as like it's like a PR movement where they were really kind of just saying like no like we don't need Britain's already done like they're probably gonna why, why are we going to get involved in a war to where then it's just only us like w if we get involved it's not going to help Britain any like it's just they need to be on their own every man for themselves um, and that was the tone in really in the 1930s by the time that the America First Committee began, it did have a lot of followers, but it was not like necessarily the way that the majority of Americans felt, especially since Lindbergh was a Nazi sympathizer. He was um, an anti-Semite. He was a radical. Not all America First Committee members um, felt that way, but he kind of, as with anything we've talked about with the labor movement or anything, kind of the most radical people um, kind of give a bad name for these groups. Um, not that I necessarily agree with the America First Committee, um, but I think what their concerns were justified. Lindbergh was a little bit out there, though. So how do we get to 1940 and a German-occupied Europe? Um, it starts with little small acts of aggression, and the uh, Allied powers, pretty much the British and the French, appeasing that. So allowing... Hitler to occupy the Rhineland, which was against the Treaty of Versailles, um, allowing for him to then take the Sudetenland, which is this tiny strip of Czechoslovakia. Um, you know, they met with him and uh, the Munich Pact, where basically they said, now Hitler, like, pr you know, pinky promise that you won't take any more land. And Hitler was like, yeah, pinky promise, like, you know, besties forever, I promise, I won't take any more. Um, but there was no opposition. There were no, there was no consequences for what Hitler was doing. And he was building up his military. Um, Mussolini had um, invaded Ethiopia, which was against what, um, like, the, went against League of Nations regulations and no one did anything. And so these small acts of aggression that went unchecked with no consequences gave Hitler really, and Mussolini just kind of followed along, it gave Hitler the confidence to be like, well, we can do whatever we want. Um, and that's pretty much exactly what he did. So after Japan invaded China in 1937, um, FDR is going to really test that public opinion because remember, this is the right, the series of neutrality acts being passed. That's kind of the tone of the American people. Um, he's going to test public opinion with his quarantine speech where he kind of says, like, listen, there are clear aggressors. There's a clear um, enemy here. And when looking at Japan and um, and Germany in particular, 
um, and that we should quarantine these aggressive governments, that we should um, propose as democracies act together in a way that um, shows some sort of like resistance to them. Um, people didn't like it. They're like, no, no, no. Stick to what let's stick to what's going on here. Remember, we are neutral. Don't even think about dipping your toe in getting involved um, of what's going on other places in the world. Um, like Woodrow Wilson, FDR is going to argue that um, we can remain neutral. However, we can prepare ourselves militarily um, just in case as we, you know, we can't be naive to the fact that these aggressive powers that it could one day affect us. Um, so Congress does increase the military and naval budgets in 1938. Um, some isolationists accept this. They're just perfectly, you know, they're, they're okay with it. Um, because if the Western hemisphere is threatened, it's okay to be prepared. Um, so when it starts to get really serious in Europe is March of 1939, Hitler breaks the Munich Pact or the Munich Agreement. Uh, one last example of uh, unchecked aggression when he occupies all of Czechoslovakia. Um, and Britain and France still don't do anything. Um, kind of the, the straw that will break the camel's back is going to be Poland. Um, and that won't happen until September. Um, again, they, uh, the, United, the Soviet Union, um, even though they are ideologically different from the Nazis, um, there was a um, a non-aggression pact that was signed between the two in 1939. It's a, it was a secret pact because both of those nations were eyeing Poland. Remember that Poland, as one of the effects of the Treaty of, Treaty of Versailles, Poland was a, a country that was created. It was this, this ethnic group of the Polish people. Um, and so that country was actually created. So they took part of Germany after World War I, and they took part of the Soviet Union, and they created the nation of Poland. And there was a lot of animosity there. And so the secret pact between the Soviet Union and Germany is going to be signed in 1939. So September um, of that year, uh, Germany invades Poland, blitzkrieg, lightning war, very quick, um, within a matter of days. Um, same thing, the Soviet Union is also, so they, they were accomplishing that goal. Britain and France declare war on Germany and the Axis powers. So Italy and Japan will declare war on them. Um, by spring of 1940, Germany had occupied Scandinavia, so Finland, Sweden, Norway, um, and then France as well. France was fully occupied by June of 1940, very, very quickly. Um, the United States is going to respond in a way where we are alarmed, um, but we still want to remain <laughs> neutral. FDR is strongly urging the opposite, that we need to help Great Britain. Um, and that by helping Great Britain, it's going to secure, it, it's a national security issue. Um, this is not going to stop at the shores of Europe. Like uh, Hitler is obviously has some sort of agenda and that this will affect us in some way, even if it's not, um, you know, politically and drawing us into war that way. But what about economically? What about our trade partners um, in that part of the world? So FDR works with Congress and they start to slowly kind of chip away at the neutrality acts. And the first is going to be the cash and carry policy in 1939. Um, so remember that focus question at the beginning. How did the United States shift its views from neutrality um, to what we have here as an example of basically aiding Great Britain in some sort of way? And then we obviously know that um, Pearl Harbor will will lead us into direct involvement. But the cash and carry policy is kind of like a compromise. Listen, we're not gonna loan them money. We're not gonna give them anything. They're gonna pay for weapons and arms and whatever the supplies that they need in cash. And then we're, they're also gonna use their own ships. So it doesn't really put the United States at that much of a risk. Um, and it'll also help us out financially at this point in time. In addition to that, you have the first draft, a peacetime draft. Um, it was unprecedented. Um, it had young men register to vote. Um, public opinion was drifting away from strict neutrality, but this also did cause, obviously, a lot of controversy. Um, in addition to that, there were the destroyers for bases deal with Britain. Um, because of the air raids, 
taking place. So the um, German Air Force is bombarding London and, and parts of Britain. Um, and so the United States basically strikes up a deal because Britain is struggling so much. They strike up a deal where, listen, we will um, help you guys with ships and then we'll, we'll get bases in return. So 50 U.S. destroyers um, in return for the United States being able to build military bases in the British Isles and in the Caribbean. Now, in 1940, we were, it was, as you can tell, it would be kind of like this dire political, it was a lot of uncertainty um, in the world, um, even though, again, most Americans are just trying to focus on keeping food on the table and staying in their homes or finding work. Um, FDR was very concerned about the future with what was going on around the world. Um, and so he broke with tradition. He ran for a third term. He called it a critical time. He didn't really trust anyone else to do it. Um, he was also popular, right? So if a different Democrat had, and even if he had endorsed a different Democrat to run, um, you know, how would Americans respond to that? They, they didn't really want to risk losing to the Republicans. Uh, Wendell Wilkie um, was someone that had criticized the New Deal. Um, he did kind of agree with FDR and preparedness. Um, his biggest criticism was the third term, um, that it broke with the Washingtonian tradition. So FDR is going to win overwhelmingly. It was a smaller more margin than 32 and 36, um, but electoral votes were um, he carried all but just a few states. Um, so important factors in his reelection, economic recovery. So this def these defense purchases was helping with especially the factories. Um, and then fear of war. Voters were, again, they just wanted something consistent. They trusted him. Um, and so they just wanted that, that consistency going into a new decade. After he was reelected, before he took office, obviously, um, but after his reelection is when he gives this, this uh, arsenal of democracy speech. And he talks about um, how, as a fireside chat, he sits down and he talks about, listen, back in you know, 1933, you were scared. And we were, um, you know, we had this banking crisis that was affecting our economy. And I sat down with you and I just was, I was honest with you and you trusted me and you've stuck with me as I've explained each New Deal program through these fireside chats, I'm now coming to you in another serious situation where I need you to trust me. I need you to understand why I believe we need to start um, or continue to help Britain in this very scary time. Um, he will also uh, address Congress uh, a few days later, a couple weeks later, um, where he says, listen, we can't, Britain Britain can't pay for these things right now. They can't give us anything else in return. We need to start lending them money um, so that they can purchase these war materials. And he talked about these four freedoms, really pay playing on people's emotions. Um, he had uh, uh, Norman Rockwell, which is a famous artist. He painted these posters that went with it. It was kind of this uh, PR move that they did where they talked about, listen, these are the things that we are willing to fight for. Um, these are things that we, freedoms that we have. Um, and what if those are taken away from you, right? So the freedom of speech and religion and want, freedom from fear, those are things that the people in Europe don't have right now because we've allowed for um, these nations to uh, become aggressive and, and take over all these um, countries that don't want to be. And so he's he's trying to draw more Americans on the side of helping the British. Um, you have the Lend-Lease Act in March of 1941. It's going to end cash and carry, and it's basically like whatever you need, whatever you want, you can have at Great Britain. In addition to that, so we're now we're aiding Britain like full on. Everybody knows about it. That's just what we're doing. Um, he knew that at some point there's probably could draw the Germans and attacking the United States. So in August of 1941, he's going to meet with Churchill um, off the coast of Newfoundland. They call this the Atlantic Charter. It was a document that really talked about um, basically a somewhat of an alliance of sorts um, and what we stood for, peace, peace. 
um, self-determination for all people, no territorial expansion, free trade. It was more symbolic than anything of the, the, the relationship of the United States and Great Britain. In July, FDR orders the U.S. Navy to escort British ships carrying lend lease materials. Um, and so a U.S. destroyer was attacked by a G German submarine. And so at that point, we have a shoot on sight um, order given by our commander in chief, which, again, just kind of like the reason this is important is we're in July of 1941, December, the Japanese are going to attack us. Um if the, Japan had never done it, like how much longer would it have taken before the United States was like actively fighting against the Germans? Um, we'll never know. So in regards to Japan, um, FDR response went, when J Japan joins the Axis power, he is going to prohibit the export of steel and scrap iron, some of the things that they really needed. Um, and this upset Japan, obviously. Um, they called it an unfriendly act. By 1941, J Japan occupied French Indochina. So that's like Vietnam today in Laos. Um, FDR is going to freeze all Japanese credit. So we're going to deny them access to oil. They need the oil to support their war effort. Um, there are a lot, like sometimes kids always say like, um, you know, I thought the reason they believed that the reason that the Japanese attacked the United States was because we took away their oil. Um, not really. Yes, they needed the oil. Um, they probably could have found it other places. The number one reason why the United States attacked Pearl Harbor had more to do with the threat that the U.S.'s presence in the region, it kind of limited their expansion. And that was their ultimate goal was to um, dominate Southeast Asia. We stood in the way of that. And that's why they they really attacked us. It was preemptive. It was um Maybe not the best decision, but uh, that was why they did it. So Sunday, December 7th, this is the date that will live in infamy, according to President Roosevelt. Um, Japanese planes took off from an aircraft carrier, about 300 planes. They flew to Pearl Harbor and they bombed every ship and airfield that was in sight. It lasted less than two hours. It killed over 2,000 Americans. Um, a lot of the men were asleep in their bunks on their ships. They sank the USS Arizona. Uh, men were um, entombed in the USS Arizona. That's a memorial there in Pearl Harbor in Hawaii today. It um, basically put our, our Pacific fleet out of commission. Uh, the U.S. had broken Japanese codes and they knew that a, an attack was imminent. They just didn't know where, possibly the Philippines. We weren't really aware that they could get their aircraft carriers that close. We didn't under, We didn't really know that their, their planes were that um, sophisticated, their bombers. Um, and the, what really saved us, though, is the fact that our aircraft carriers were out to, at sea and they were training. Because if we had to rebuild and replace aircraft carriers, that would have really set us back um, as we are going to start pursuing the Japanese um, in the Pacific theater. So FDR addressed this Congress the next day, asked for Congress to declare war. They do so. Um, and then obviously on Japan, Germany and Italy declare war on the United States in the days following. Um, by June of, uh, in, in June of 1941, um, Germany had already broken the pact. So Germany with the Soviet Union. So really kind of like stabbed uh, Stalin in the back, Hitler did, and had attacked the Soviet Union. So this allowed for the United States and Britain, who were natural allies here, to unite themselves with the Soviet Union with the common enemy of Germany. We did not like the Soviet Union, right? Um, we disagree with them ideologically. We definitely didn't like the fact of the non-aggression pact, but now we have to work with them in order to defeat Germany. Um, and that will be the strategy, it's a Europe first strategy, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So what's going on at home? Um, the federal government is going to mobilize much like how it did during World War I, um, but the New Deal has also kind of it's, it's made it easier when we're looking at rolling out new government programs during this war effort. Um, it's been done now for a Great Depression. So the role of the federal government is going to expand much more so than it did during World War I or even the New Deal. This is like 
we're used to this at this point. Um, the success of the Allied forces depends pretty much solely on the American people mobilizing. Remember, like just our population and our factories alone is so much larger than that of Britain or even the Soviet Union. And so we are going to use our factories, we're going to use our people, we are going to ration and we are going to raise money. All of that, it really does depend on us. And they made it very clear, um, the United States government did. So the War Production Board is going to manage all the industries. What do we need? Um, uh, what, what products need to be made? Um, or I guess like military products need to be made. The Office of War Mobilization is going to set priorities of those raw materials of like oil and rubber and gas and things like that. Um, the United States government is going to hire out or contract companies to do it. So like the Ford Motor Company is going to be contracted out to make B-52s or whatever it might be. And those contractors are going to pay be paid at cost plus a profit. Um, in order to, especially like per unit, right? So they want them to, they want a lot of tanks and they want a lot of planes. The Office of Price Administration is going to regulate pretty much every aspect of the civilian's life. So they froze prices. So there was no, um, you know, the cost of goods would not go up during the war. Um, wages were also frozen um, and as were rent. Um, and then they also would issue ration cards. So I'll show you guys that in class um, where you were limited the amount of meat, sugar, gas, how many tires you could buy in a year. Um, no new vehicles. Like there were no vehicles made within this time period. Like consumerism is lower during these years. And instead, these factories are producing goods or producing materials for the war effort. Federal spending is going to increase a thousand percent between 1939 and 1945. So remember when we looked at Keynesian economics and how you can you know, deficit spending in order to help stimulate the economy, the GNP is going to go up 15% more each year. So Keynesian economics does show you that you can spend your way out of a depression. Um, what the New Deal couldn't do, World War II did. Um, by 1945, uh, the national debt was at over $250 billion, and that was five times what it was in 1941. So U.S. industries are going to exceed production and profits than they did in the 1920s because of that wartime demand. So in the 1920s, you had, especially the early 1920s, you had this consumerism. The consumerism was what was driving the demand, and then it started to slow down, and that's what led to um, the stock market crash and then the Great Depression. Um, but the war is really demanding that these goods are being made. They're demanding um, jobs in order to, to fill these factories. And so by 1944, unemployment was pretty much non-existent. They really couldn't even measure it at that point in time. Um, there was work to do in some sort of way, whether you were a soldier fighting or enlisted, doing some type of work um, in that regard, or if you were working in one of the factories or in one of the farms. War-related industrial output in the United States was twice of that of the Axis powers combined, okay? Um, instead of automobiles, they are producing tanks and planes. Um, over 300,000 planes were produced in the four years of the war, 100,000 tanks. Um, the shipyards are producing one ship every two weeks. And we're like, when we're talking about what goes into a sh one of these large ships, whether it be a destroyer or a um, battleship, um, to think how efficient they must have been, because these things are the size of, you know, buildings. Um, production was concentrated with the largest corporations. So some of the downsides here are your largest corporations are going to be getting all the business. They're going to be earning all the profits. Um, where smaller businesses are going to lose out on those government contracts. And I know that it makes sense logistically, right? It makes sense that, well, Ford has the factory size to do this. It has the ability to, to get their workers in there. They've got, they're productive and they're efficient. Um, but it did have, it's, it's going to concentrate a lot of the wealth with the corporations, especially since when you think about uh, wages are frozen. So yes, these companies are making these products at cost plus a profit. So, but the wages are frozen. So corporations are going to be making a lot of money and then the workers 
aren't. A um, hundred largest the 100 largest corporations accounted up for 70% of all wartime manufacturing, and Uncle Sam is footing the bill the entire way. The wages and the profits and all of that, that's going to lead to some union issues um, towards the end of the war. For the most part, Americans are kind of going to buy in to, like, this is what we need to do. And, yeah, it's maybe not all that fair, but this is the patriotic thing to do. They're going to buy into it for the beginning part. For most of the war, um, there's going to be some union threats, I think, um, and, and there'll be Congress will respond to that. Um, but it really is going to play a large role towards the end of the war. Um, one of the other things that's created during the war agencies is going to be the Office of Research and Development. Here are your scientists, your engineers, your physicists, um, and they are going to really try to improve our technology for the war. So electronically, the radar and sonar are these new technologies as so they're trying to improve them throughout the war. That was one of the issues with uh, Pearl Harbor is that radar could not work like from their stations. You know, Hawaii has a lot of mountains and island chains. And so it was really pr like almost primitive to where like you couldn't really tell like what was coming. Um, you knew something was coming, but like, oh, well, maybe that's a flock of birds or maybe that is, you know, one of our planes. Like there's no way to kind of really know. Um, in medicine, penicillin is going to change um, a a lot in regards to like it deaths. If you think about the Civil War and the Spanish American War and you know Revolutionary War, all those before when we had these huge loss of life, um, a lot of it the people are dying from infection and from disease instead of like the actual like physical wounds. So penicillin as an antibiotic is going to save a lot of men's lives. Um, also like blood donations and plasma, those are things that they're that. Um, doctors are realizing that you can give, if a man loses a lot of blood, like you can give them a blood transfusion. Um, that's new in medical field. Um, they are working on jet engines and rocket propulsion. And of course, um, the Manhattan Project, which was top secret. Um, uh, there were thousands of people that were like, they didn't know what they were working on, but there were like thousands of Americans that were actually working on the atomic bomb project. Um, some knew what was going on and then others um, in a more distant lab, like maybe doing like math equations, um, <clears throat> also contributed to that. Ironically, many of the European scientists that in university, like in professors and, and educators um, that had fled these fascist governments in Europe in the years leading up to the war, they fled, they came here, and, and now they're working on these projects to defeat the Axis powers. So now we get to talk about our workers and our unions. So labor unions and large corporations, they really did kind of agree that we're not going to do any strikes during the war, that this is just the patriotic duty, that we'll work it out. Um, workers start to become disgruntled, though, when they start realize, realizing how high the profits are for these corporations, even though the workers aren't um, seeing their wages go up. I will also say that because there was a price freeze and because that there wasn't a lot of consumer spending, workers, American workers had the ability to save a decent amount of money during these years. So it's not like they were struggling financially. I think that this was kind of more of a like they just saw an injustice in in how these contracts were laid out. Um, there was talk of a coal strike, and so Congress is gonna pass the Smith-Conley Anti-Strike Act. Now, FDR is gonna veto it um, because he worried about like long-term, like what, that, you know, he's a labor man, right? If you think about even like the New Deal, like this was his view he believed in kind of protecting the people. And so I think he vetoed it more out of um, sticking to his base. Um, but what's ironic about this is that eventually he will use the law in 1944 when there is a, a, a huge railroad strike because they need the railroads for the war. So he'll actually end up using the military um, in order to end that strike. So how do we pay for all this, right? We talked about the deficit. Um, they do try to raise as many as much funds as possible. Um, anytime the government needs to to raise revenue, it's gonna come from taxes. So they're gonna increase the income tax, which if you think about, you know, with this decade of depression, anytime that there was, you know, with social security, like it kind of like the, the economy reacted, um, but we have demand at this point, the war is driving that. So they, um, 
increased income tax. So now for the first time, like the majority of Americans are required to pay. And especially since unemployment was really low, like a lot of people are going to be paying income tax. It's not like what it um, is today, like percentage wise. Um, 1944, taxes are actually being withheld from paychecks instead of people sending in a check to pay their taxes. So as you guys become adults and you realize like how to pay your taxes, most Americans are, I would say, well, I don't know about most, but how I pay my taxes is I would rather it be withheld from my check each month. And then at the end of the year, I can like file for my taxes and I've already paid them. And most of the time I get money back. Like I actually overpaid in my taxes. Um, some Americans, but, but the why that they did that at this point in time though, is because the government needed the money right then. Like they didn't want to have to wait until next year when people paid their taxes. Um, they wanted to have the money as they went along. Um, there are some Americans that like to get all their money, right? And then they'll write a check um, when it's time to pay their taxes. It just kind of depends on, I guess, if you're good at saving money or not. Um, Another way that they're going to raise revenue is selling war bonds, and they're going to use celebrities to do that. They're going to use propaganda. Um, they sold over $135 billion in war bonds. We've talked about bonds before. It's basically a way how the government is borrowing money from the American people. It's a piece of paper that says it's an IOU from the American government. Um, but again, because there was such a shortage of consumer goods, it made it easy for people to save money, which is going to play a role in the post-war era because they were able to save their paychecks and because like women and men were working. And when I say men, so like, yes, you could have two like women and men working in a factory. Um, but even if your husband is an enlisted soldier and he's overseas, like he's getting a paycheck. Um, and so they were able to save that money and it's going to play a role in the baby boom. It's going to play a role in like housing, demand for housing and um, kind of the, the economic boom of the 1950s. So how do we convince Americans that they need to be doing all these things to save, you know, to ration, to, to do their part, to, to volunteer, to work, um, to buy war bonds? Um, they did it with propaganda. Uh, the goal was not really to like keep people on board, but it was to maintain morale because this was hard, right? Encourage it. Um, say like, you know, I know this is hard work, but you're doing a great job. Like keep it up. Like it's for the boys, right? Um, the Office of War Information, which is very similar to what we talked about with World War I, controlled news. Um, they controlled the troop movement and battles of so movies, radio, music, all of it is reflecting this cheerful patriotic view of the world of uh, the war. Um, very similar like Norman Rockwell's Four Freedoms, like really playing to people's emotions, saying like, listen, you know, it could be worse. You could be in occupied France right now. Um, and again, they're just really trying to encourage people to, to do their part. Um, some movie stars like that enlisted. Uh, so like, um, well, Ronald Reagan, for example, Ronald Reagan was an actor during these years. Um, and he was he enlisted and he his job was to act in movies or like little clips, I guess, that were shown at the beginning of movies if you went to go watch them on, on the weekends, or they would also plan for the soldiers and things like that. Um, and again, it was really just to kind of drum up support for the war. So during the war, and because of the Great Depression, um, people are willing to pick up and move to find jobs. So there's a there's an increase in factory jobs. So there are rural people, again, an increase in that rural to urban migration. Um, it's going to be concentrated kind of in the Midwest and then also the Pacific Coast. So a lot of things being produced in California. In addition to that, uh, construction of new factories and military bases predominantly are going to be created in the southern states. Um, due to climate, due to cheap land, due to the fact that wages are um, a little bit lower, you pay people smaller amount, and all that connects back to the Civil War and the Reconstruction era. So remember that the, the American South was slow to industrialize. It really wasn't until after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, during that, that new South uh, period of time. Um, and so remember that with um, in agriculture, that the wages are really low. And so when you would build a factory in Birmingham, Alabama, 
um, the wages, you didn't have to pay your workers as much. Um, and so this is what we call the Sunbelt migration. Um, it will also extend into the 1950s. It'll be something that people will, especially during the Cold War, as the United States government starts building like NASA, Cape Canaveral, and in Houston, they're choosing those locations based on um, the fact that it's a really good deal. Okay, so that's the Sunbelt migration. So in addition to that, we talked about the Great Migration with African Americans starting in World War I. It actually is a, a period of time that connects all the way through World War II. Um, there's still a large trend of African Americans making their way off of, you know, away as sharecroppers and tenant farmers into factory positions, whether it's in northern cities or even certain cities in the south. Um, so 1.5 million Black Americans are going to move out of the South during this time period. A million African American men are going to join the armed services in segregated units um, facing discrimination. There's going to be a series of race riots in 1943 in Detroit and New York City because of that racial tension. Um, Civil rights leaders, much like how W.E.B. Du Bois suggested um, during World War I, certain civil rights leaders encouraged African Americans to join to adopt the double V slogan. So victory for um, democracy abroad and at home. Um, and again, the idea was if we're fighting for this, because that's what FDR really pushed is that we are protecting like the four freedoms, we're protecting our democracy and our life, the way that, you know, we live, you know, in this privileged way, um, African-Americans, not so much as there's a lot of hypocrisy in that. And so they're arguing, hey, listen, if we're fighting for democracy overseas, we're going to be fighting for democracy at home. What's interesting here is that after the war, um, the civil rights movement is going to happen. And that's not a coincidence. It's because of um, the strides that were made for African-Americans during the war, the Tuskegee Airmen, um, and their success, uh, very much like how we talked about, like the 54th Massachusetts Regiment during the Civil War, the Tuskegee mm -hmm. Airmen were superior at what they did. It wasn't, um, and it really did prove a lot of people wrong that they were um, completely qualified. And then soon the federal government under the Truman um, administration is going to start to kind of take on civil rights as a part of their federal policy. Um, first with uh, uh, integrating the armed services. Um, so it starts with the federal government after World War II and then civil rights leaders um, uh, make more strides in the private sector. Membership in the NAACP is going to increase during the war. And then your first civil rights group is called CORE. That's how you'll probably hear me refer to it most of the time, the Congress on Racial Equality. Um, they are trying to improve the lives of African Americans. They're going to be a leading organization. Again, we're going to talk a lot about them in the 1950s and 60s. Like I said earlier, um, they're going to start to prevent discrimination in the government and businesses that receive any type of federal con uh, contracts. So if, if they're hiring Ford Motor Company, the Ford Motor Company cannot discriminate against African Americans. The Smith uh, v. Albright uh, Supreme Court case uh, deemed that it was unconstitutional to deny membership to any political parties to African Americans on the basis of race. And because that was one of the ways that they prevented them in voting in primary. So how do you get maybe an African American candidate um, on the Democratic ticket in a local election if they can't vote in the primaries. Um, so then they're kind of like forced to white from, vote for maybe white candidates. And so that was an important stride that took place during the war. Mexican Americans are going to work in defense, defense industry. Over 300,000 are going to serve in the United States military um, or in, in World War II. The Bracero program is really important. It was an agreement between the United States and Mexico that allowed for migrant farm workers to come and go a little bit more easily and kind of do not have to go through the same immigration procedures. It was very similar to what existed before the Great Depression. Um, during the Great Depression, obviously, there was a tightening on immigration because white uh, farmers who had like lost their land or their farms, they took up those migrant positions and would move from farm to farm. And so because of discrimination, um, uh, landowners would hire white workers instead of the Mexican 
um, migrants. And so the Bracero program just made it very simple that they could come and go as they were needed. Um, it really benefited um, the American economy and farmers, and it also benefited um, the Mexican migrant workers as well. There was a lot of discrimination especially in California, towards Mexican-Americans. Um, in L.A. in 1943, there was the Zoot Suit Riot. Um, a Zoot Suit was a fancy style of the time period. It kind of reminds me of like the 1930s, like kind of like um, it was a long coat and like a certain type, of, almost like the, like the gangster, like if you were to think of like, a, like a, an old school like gangster um, suit where it was like, it was a nice material. Anyways, this was a, a style that a lot of Mexican Americans wore in California. And what happened is violence broke out between some American sailors and some zoot suitors, um, which is these young Mexican American kids that happened to be wearing these nice suits out on a Saturday night. The sailors were there and they um, got into a disagreement because basically how the sailors saw it is here are these guys wearing that, because remember that you know consumerism is down. So the fact that these young men would have such a nice suit meant that they probably weren't following the rules of, um, of I guess like the rationing and all of that. Um, meanwhile, the sailors see themselves as like, you know, um, being, patriotic and, you know, fight, doing their part in the war. And these kids are just out, you know, drinking and having a good time on Saturday night. They don't, you know, understand. And so it, the violence, um, the, the sailors targeted the zoot suitors, the Mexican Americans. So that just an example of some discrimination that existed in California at that time. American Indians, 25,000 are going to serve in the military. The Navajo code talkers are a really, really important reason why we were able to have some success in the Pacific theater. Um, the Japanese were very good at breaking our codes um, so that they could interpret like where, you know, where we were moving ships and things like that. One of the things they realized, though, is that they could not understand the Navajo language. They could not figure it out. They could not break it down. Um, and it's not like that there are a lot of Navajo in Japan to where they could have someone translate. Um, and so we used um, uh, the Navajo in the military for that, and they were instrumental. Uh, we still honor the Navajo code talkers today. There's a movie out in case you're interested. Thousands will work in the defense industries. They'll find jobs off of the reservation. Um, and many of them will not end up going back on the reservations. They kind of assimilate into American society and, and live off of the off of their reservations from that point on. Um, so looking at Japanese Americans, almost 20,000 native born Japanese Americans are going to serve loyally in the United States military during World War II. But after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japanese Americans, many of them were being suspected of spies. There was just a general um, distrust in Japanese uh, people or even like a lot of like anti-Asian uh, like racism as well. Um, on the West Coast, there was this a, a general fear that um, there would be an attack by the Japanese on the West Coast. And so what they did in 1942 is the government or uh, FDR issued Executive Order 9906. Over 100,000 Japanese Americans that lived on the West Coast were forced to leave their homes. They had to um, close down their businesses, leave their homes, and were basically put in these internment camps um, west of a certain line. So they wanted to get the Japanese Americans away from the coast in order to like prevent them from aiding the Japanese, I guess, in any type of attack. Or if they did attack us, um, they didn't want any Japanese Americans on a, in case they were spies. Um, this is another example of civil liberties being limited during a time of war. Um, in the video that you guys watched, you kind of got to see what it was like um, and the effects of that. Korematsu v. U.S. was the Supreme Court case that actually upheld um, the executive order. So that during a time of war, the president as the commander in chief can limit people's civil liberties. Now, in 1988, the federal government will agree that it was unjust and they actually paid reparations to the descendant or the remaining Japanese Americans that were still alive that were put in those internment camps. But they lived there for years. Um, uh, even though that they did nothing wrong. <laughs>
women are going to play a really important role. And again, much like when we look at African Americans and the effects that the war had on um, African Americans and civil rights, it's going to be very similar with women as well. So over 200,000 women actually serve in non-combat roles. Um, the Women's Army Corps, they were nurses, they drove trucks. This, this is all in Europe. Um, or eventually once, um, uh, once we kind of in Britain and things like that. Um, they, I think they actually ended up being in France as well. Um, operators, electricians, African-American women served in a segregated unit. Um, the, the largest unit of African-American women actually sorted mail for the U.S. troops and kind of went through the mail. Five million women, women are going to join the workforce. They're mostly industrial jobs. This is where we get Rosie the Riveter um, as like a piece of propaganda to inspire women to... Um, you know, do their part and show like the strength of women. It's kind of um, been used uh, to support like feminism. And again, like with African-Americans and the civil rights movement, it's not a coincidence that the feminist movement um, will eventually come out of in the years following um, World War II.